people heard of the Roosevelt guy, I suppose, but uh, well, I'm going to, I'm on a leash tonight, so I'll try to watch this. I was speaking recently and took, uh, I mean, I knew what time it was, but you can't hear. Is that better if I just talk louder? Thanks. Um, well, they both work. Okay. No, I, I was just saying that I um, was speaking recently, and I knew I was going over, but I said by way of apology that, uh, sorry if I'm going over, but my, uh, I left my watch home, <clears throat> and someone yelled out, yeah, but there's a calendar behind you. <laughs> Don't put that on my speaker's resume. <laughs> um, I am very proud to be here, and uh, also proud as a um, lifelong admirer of Theodore Roosevelt to uh, wave the flag for him. And uh, yes, it's a penultimate uh, event in your series, but the last individual president you are celebrating. <clears throat> and the series would take almost four years if you did every president. Whether the president is regarded as great or a failure, it's instructive to spend an evening, at least an evening, talking about the life and times of that person. So, uh, and I guess next month you will be doing that, but uh, this is not about um, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, uh, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, <laughs> Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley, and this guy, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, and then I'm required to genuflect Truman, <laughs> Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and the rest. Um, <laughs> By the way, I think every American citizen ought to be able to, to do that and know, well, no, no, the, all the presidents and the, uh, uh, it's a way to know American history is to know who was helping guide the ship uh, during the years. But in any event, this will be about Roosevelt, and I do uh, believe, always have believed, and I hope I can conv convince the naysayers that he was, he was clearly the most interesting American we've had, and I'm including Franklin, and he was the most intellectual uh, man we've had in the office, and I'm including Jefferson. But um, I think he was, was the greatest president. But, you know, I named all those presidents, and the White House was different in years past than it is now. Now to be visitor in the White House or to stay over or to dine in the White House, mostly when you read about it, it's if you're a major contributor to a campaign. Right. But at one time, the White House was a salon of all, you know, the great people of, of the day, uh, artists and, and, and writers and thinkers. And uh, I'm not the first to do this. My friend Edmund Morris did it. Uh, so I'm only going to paraphrase. And others have made this observation. But go back in your minds in time and imagine a day when um, in the dining room of the White House, um, there were, okay, let's see, a best-selling author, a boxer, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a writer for children's magazines, a world-renowned expert on songbirds, uh, an editor of a Christian weekly magazine, a, candidate, a former candidate for mayor of New York City, a big game hunter, patron of the arts, uh, a soldier who would be awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, a cowboy, a rancher, a world explorer, uh, an author of approximately 50 books, um, the former governor of the largest state in the Union, a respected historian, uh, a world-renowned naturalist and explorer. Imagine all those people at the White House in one place. You can imagine them in one. You can imagine them at one table. That would be Theodore Roosevelt having breakfast alone. <laughs> and those were uh, 
those were some of the aspects of, um, of Roosevelt, the multifaceted, uh, multifaceted uh, man, a Renaissance man, if you would. Uh, I, I want you to get the picture that not only did he have all those interests and all those accomplishments, he was a Renaissance man, but there was a, pers uh, a, a, a perfect storm in inept term this week, I think, but uh, in the person of Roosevelt. He had, just at the right time in American history, uh, the personality in that office. He's still the youngest man to have served as our president. Uh, young family. Um, he wrote a book called A Strenuous Life. He was larger than life. Um, and it was at a time when America was expanding and feeling youthful. And here comes this guy with a young family and uh, they're all vivacious. And um, also in the media, it was at a time when news photographs were getting common and newsreels and cartoons, as I'll be showing you. But all this came together. So even his opponents, and he had a few, and at times when he didn't have enough, he sort of made a few. <laughs> he, he, liked to, he didn't like to pick fights, but he sure didn't mind fighting. Uh, but he, it was almost like if Roosevelt had not come along at that point in our history, America would have had to invent him. <clears throat> now in Bully, in this book, I tried to do three things that other of the many books, hundreds of books, and more books about Roosevelt than any other figure in American history than except for Lincoln. But I tried to bring out, uh, to do three things that other books hadn't done. One was, it's astonishing that others haven't done this, but the role of his father in his life. Now other biographers have said, yes, he was a strong man. Roosevelt opened his own autobiography. The first line was, my father was the best man I ever knew. So it's not that that was hidden under a bushel, but his father was a, uh, ph philanthropist, uh, the Roosevelts were among the richest families in New York, and his father reluctantly accepted a post, a reform post in the New York Customs House in the late 1870s. He had never been in politics. He still helped establish programs during the Civil War. He didn't fight, but he established a program uh, Lincoln gave him the green light to uh, encourage soldiers to send a portion of their meager pay home. And Roosevelt's father went around to uh, camps and battlefields for the length of the war to, to do that work. And it was very important work. Many other philanthropies and everything. But he was persuaded to become collector of the New York Customs House in the 1870s. It was a cesspool of corruption. and. <coughs> He was charged with cleaning it up, and he took that responsibility, but because of politics that I won't, that are in my book, so I, I won't go into it now. Um, New York's senators uh, killed his nomination in the Senate, and the only way they could do that to convince other senators to vote against the sterling Mr. Roosevelt was to trash him, and his father was humiliated and dragged through the mud and defeated and died a few months later. And <clears throat> it's never been explored by other um, writers. I didn't want to be an armchair psychologist, but when young Theodore went into politics, barely 20 years old, from the start, he was a reformer, a fierce reformer. And he stood up to the establishment and the corrupt bosses. And one of the first things he did in the assembly was to investigate a judge who had been accepting bribes, and um, the judge was nearly impeached. Uh, Roosevelt, as young as he was, was nominated for the speakership his first year, the second year in the assembly after one year service, and um, and then all through his life, whether you view him as a conservative uh, or a radical, and there are different stripes of progressivism and whatever his fights were, he was always a reformer. And that's become a, a, an unused, not a misused term these days, but uh, 
you can reform from the left and from the right, but he, uh, in my mind, that makes him a conservative to reform and keep the best of everything, but it's nothing to nitpick over, but he was always a reformer and I think inspired by his father. Second thing I wanted to bring out in the book was that he was, uh, when he left the presidency, he was offered many jobs, presidencies of universities, um, editorship of Collier's Magazine and um, of the New York Sun, very prominent positions. I mean, he's barely 50. Uh, and instead, he became the editor, contributing editor <coughs> of uh, the Outlook Magazine, which was a rather small weekly Christian uh, news and opinion magazine. And that became his platform. He wrote for it. Um, he wrote some uh, pieces on uh, on Christianity and the the, uh, uh, the service that a Christian uh, citizen uh, should um, execute uh, in public. And it's an aspect that history has sort of forgotten. He titled two of his books from Bible verses. Um, I mean, there are just many, uh, many things that say about Roosevelt, and he was larger than life and exuberant, and he had a large ego, but he didn't parade his uh, faith or his activities um, that much, uh, so it's therefore been forgotten by history, but that was a big part of his life and his ministry. He was invited on a speaking tour, um, Earl Theological Ceremony, a Seminary in California, had a, uh, it was the Earl Lecture Series at the uh, at California Theological Seminary and they invited Roosevelt to give the lecture in 1911. They knew it was gonna be nearby on a, a speaking tour and he begged off because he didn't have time to prepare the lectures in advance. Uh, but then he got back with them right away and he said, how about if I uh, speak extemporaneously and then if you want to publish them, you, know, you can have a stenographer take them down. And they said, well, fine. So he spoke five nights, 90 minutes a night, without notes on the subject of a Christian citizenship in a republic. Just brilliant. So that shows not only his industry, we shall say, but also um, his faith. And they're very moving, very appropriate today for us to read. Okay, the third aspect was cartoons. Roosevelt was the most cartooned president in history. Um, I went through 20,000 cartoons to come to choose just under 300, and I sort of felt like, like the father who was challenged to say, of your 20,000 children, which 300 are your, that doesn't exactly work, but uh, <laughs> it's hard to do. It was hard to do, it was excruciating, but, uh, but it was fun to do. Uh, but he was the most cartooned president, part of the perfect storm. He has newspaper technology. They didn't have to do woodcuts, the cartoonists. It could be photo engraved from paper to, to newspaper in a couple hours. Um, but it was also his personality. Other presidents would be controversial and they'd have policies that, you know, raise dust and such. But cartoonists would sometimes characterize those policies, even the president in question, as um, as Uncle Sam, because of his government uh, policy, or the elephant or the donkey. But in Roosevelt's time, it was always Roosevelt, because as a former cartoonist, I could, well, you know, you can imagine this. He was irresistible. The glasses, the mustache, the teeth. He, he, um, he didn't um, walk. Well, I'm reminded uh, he, he could have had a, a, a go between Salina and uh, Hutch, and I don't know. <laughs> he didn't walk, he ran. He didn't uh, speak, he gesticulated, uh, and there are movies. I mean, he was just larger than life and a magnet for cartoonists. And on slow news days, he was the cartoonist's dream. Cartoonists could draw what he did, what he might have done, what he might do. He was just the perfect subject. So what we're left with is a legacy of many, many great and colorful cartoons. And of course, one of my theses is that um, one of the best ways to study history and to learn what life was like in other times 
was through, is through cartoons and humor because we know how people acted, how they dressed, what they laughed at. There's a lot to be learned through that. Um, so uh, Roosevelt gives us a perfect picture of that. So let's, um, let's look at some cartoons. I'll walk you through. These are in random order because he had a random career. And uh, there it goes. That's not a cartoon, but that is artwork. Not by me, but uh, there is at different ages and different uh, moods and costumes. And okay, this is the very first national, the very first cartoon of, in any venue of um, Roosevelt. And uh, just a newcomer in the assembly, he. Um, he was pushing reforms in New York City's government to basically take the teeth and the claws from Tammany Hall reform. And he was successful. Tammany bounced back, of course, but at the time he was successful. The three figures in the back are three former mayors who failed to do what this young assemblyman uh, got to do. And um, the bill did go through in the state assembly, and it was signed by the young Governor Cleveland. And uh, February 20th is a date. This is the front cover of Puck Magazine, a weekly political cartoon commentary magazine. And it is less than a week uh, after his wife and mother died. Um, uh, tough, the seminal time in his life, but his wife and mother died within hours of each other under the same roof of different diseases, his wife and childbirth, and uh, tumultuous time. Roosevelt finished the legislative section, session, became a major figure in the Republican presidential convention that year, and then went west and was a rancher and cowboy for three years and just dealt with life. These are sketches that a caricaturist made when Roosevelt was giving a speech in, I think it's 1896. This ran as a full page in the New York World, and it's a British caricaturist who was visiting America and drew some of his impressions of Roosevelt as a speaker. I like the three along the bottom where he morphs into a bulldog. And I chose this one because um, this was a way of advertising in those days. They used to uh, 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 cast magic lantern slides on the sides of buildings. And they would do election returns on campaign nights and advertisers would put their messages up. And when Roosevelt was police commissioner, he was famous for going around uh, the city rather incognito to, uh, at night to check up on cops who were sleeping on the beat or taking bribes or something. So, uh, so that's the idea of the policeman being scared. But uh, very early in his career, I mean, this shows that Roosevelt was known by the icons of the glasses and teeth. That's all the public needed to know about him. And of course, the cartoonist traffic in icons, it's, it's the tool of the, uh, of the cartoonist. And he was romanticized even in opposition newspapers uh, when the uh, when the Spanish-American War came and he had the victory at San Juan Hill, the most prominent soldier to come out of the war. And it's a cover of the old Life magazine. The original Life magazine was a weekly cartoon and humor magazine. I like to say that was a Life magazine that was intentionally funny. <laughs> and. Uh, and McKinley, President McKinley was often caricatured as Napoleon, not for any of his personality traits, but because a lot of people thought his profile looked like Napoleon's, I know. But uh, there he was, the teeth and the glasses casting a shadow. This was in the midpoint of McKinley's presidency. And the cartoonist is saying that this young colonel from the Cuban campaign might overshadow him. Well. He did. He wound up being uh, named vice president when McKinley ran for re-election. <clears throat> Here we are with his um, 
his private secretary, William Loeb, whose son ran the first newspaper I worked for, the Manchester Union Leader in New Hampshire. He became a newspaper publisher, but uh, anyway, Loeb is uh, asking Roosevelt what costume, what persona he would like to uh, uh, assume that day. And I mentioned in my little trick opening, but Roosevelt is the only person in American history to be the winner of both the Congressional Medal of Honor for his wartime exploits, heroism, and the Nobel Peace Prize. It's remarkable, really. Here's the icon again. Uh, and as I say, you know, this, this wouldn't have been done here. This is when he sent the great white fleet around the world, and it's towards the end of his administration. He thought the best way for America to um, get respect of other countries and to keep the peace was that every country around the world should know how strong we were and that we'd be willing to use our strength. And he constantly badgered, fought with Congress to add to our fleet. And he would always ask for four battleships and settle for two, and he always knew two was what the best he could hope for, et cetera, et cetera. But he sent the great white fleet around the world, and the Senate, which, by the way, was a Republican Senate, his own party, but they were so tired of his, a lot of them, the leadership was, tired of his shenanigans, the old guard, huh? that they denied the, um, the funding for the fleet's crews around the world. Roosevelt sent the fleet off anyway in a great ceremony and wrote a message to Congress saying that uh, if you want them to come back when the fuel runs out, you're going to have to <laughs> <laughs> appropriate those funds. The kind of thing he did. He set apart more uh, lands as national parks, national monuments, bird sanctuaries than uh, than any other president, tens of thousands of acres a day. I did the arithmetic in the book, um, often against Congress's wishes, um, and God bless him, because we wouldn't have a lot what we do today if he, if what, what we have today in public lands if he hadn't done that. And it was a similar thing. Congress uh, got tired of this, especially senators from um, logging states, mining states, and, and such. Um, so they passed a law taking a lot of the president's discretionary powers away. And Roosevelt and his chief forester, Gifford Pinchot, uh, stayed up till midnight on the day that the uh, authority expired, setting aside millions of acres. God bless him. It's the cover of Collier's. Maxfield Parrish was the artist. This was the week of his inauguration his, as president in his own right. It's a comic strip, Foxy Grandpa, a strip of the day in which the two mischievous grandsons would always try to put one over on their grandfather and he got the best of them at the end. And in this one, they uh, asked Governor Roosevelt to challenge Grandpa to a wrestling match. Of course, they know he'll lose. But as you see, he doesn't. But Roosevelt was so popular that he starred in comic strips and cartoons and early animated cartoons. And we all know about the teddy bear that was named for him. He had nothing to do with that. And then the Roosevelt Bears uh, children's books and comic strips, uh, magazine features, and this is a page, uh, the only comic strip the New York Times ever ran in its history was the Roosevelt Bears. Mm -hmm. And this uh, ran for almost two years in the New York Times. Judge Magazine published a quarterly that collected, co collected on the inside their cartoons on certain themes. But in these years, when the Gibson girl was um, the big thing in America, there'd always be pretty girl covers, prominent illustrators painting pretty girls, except when they wanted to sell maybe more issues and they'd put Roosevelt on the cover. I love this for the iconography because uh, Roosevelt um, caused 
he had to work hard not to be, <coughs> excuse me, renominated in 1980. He was so popular, but he had made a promise not to run again. And the people wanted him, and a lot of people in the party did. And one way to keep his promise was to hand pick a successor and just push him, push him, push him. And that was William Howard Taft, his Secretary of War. And this cartoonist on the cover of Life magazine had the situation down perfectly at the time of the, uh, at, the at the opening of the political year 1908, uh, excuse me, before the inauguration uh, 1909. Taft and Sherman, James Schoolcraft Sherman, were the new president and vice president, but there was no way that Theodore Roosevelt would leave the national scene or the public consciousness, and uh, it's a brilliant way of depicting him that way. Very similar, uh, a year or so later, to give Taft, to not steal a spotlight from Taft, a couple of weeks after he left the presidency, Roosevelt went to Africa um, big game hunt, he collected specimens for the uh, Smithsonian and um, was away for 15 months after the African safari. He went to Europe and uh, was feted by all the crowned heads and uh, he wrote home and he said, if I, I think if I meet another king I should bite him. Uh, <laughs> but they all wanted to meet him. He was such a celebrity, the leading citizen of the world. And then when he was in Europe, King Edward died, and Taft named him the American representative to the funeral. And uh, it was a very interesting event. He was sort of the star of that, but all the crown heads of Europe were at that, outdoing each other in finery in the funeral uh, cortege. And Roosevelt was one of only two in <coughs> a frock coat, a suit. There weren't many republics in those days. Um, but this also, I mean, this is cartoon I iconography. It's not Roosevelt, it's, it's animals, and yet we see by the uh, trademark uh, characteristics that uh, there's our boy. This is similar. When he came home from Africa and Europe, Harper's Weekly, which was a magazine that was opposed to him, drew this cover. America went crazy, bring him back. It was one of the biggest ticker tape parades in, in Manhattan history. And there again, we have the same thing. I think there's a brilliant cartoon, E.W. Kemble, who had illustrated um, Huckleberry Finn. But um, it's a cartoonist. I love this because we know it's Uncle Sam, even though we can't see his face. And we know that's Roosevelt, once again, by the glasses and the teeth, but there's no question there, and it's just, uh, there's no doubt about what he's saying in the cartoon. Oh, I haven't used this. Yeah, the glasses and the teeth. But you knew where they were. Okay. Uh, when he was thinking of Rose running for president in 1912, a cartoonist uh, made a pun out of the, his his famous phrase, the big stick. He, Roosevelt once said, I am fond of the West African proverb, carry, uh, speak softly, carry a big stick, and you will go far. So big stick diplomacy became the, the, uh, the slogan of his uh, foreign policy. So the cartoonist drew this drawing of Roosevelt eyeing the White House again and called it the big sticker, or called him the big sticker. All right, we get it. When he clashed um, with Taft, uh, he had a big falling out with Taft because Taft had turned very conservative and betrayed a lot of Roosevelt's policies, particularly with regard to uh, conservation. Uh, Taft in four years busted, busted more trusts than Roosevelt did in seven and, and a half, so Taft was reasonably constructive, but um, there were primaries that were held. Roosevelt won most of them, and uh, including in Taft's own state of Ohio and his own district. Um, but not every state held primaries, so Roosevelt was clearly the choice of the rank and file, but Taft still controlled the party machinery. And 
Roosevelt delegates weren't seated and um, the insurgents and progressives bolted the convention and held their own and that's why the, that's how the Progressive Party was born a hundred years ago. And uh, this cartoonist in the Cleveland Plain Dealer drew Roosevelt as the uh, butterfly leaving the uh, chrysalis of the, uh, of the Republican elephant. Now, in fact, he came in second. He got more votes than Taft. Taft only carried two states. So it's clear that if one of them had been the nominee, they would have carried the election, but the third, the Wilson, or Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat candidate and he won with a plurality. <coughs> Donahue is the cartoonist, William Donahue, uh, Joseph Donahue, his brother William drew Teeny Weenies, that old comic strip. Um, but Joe Donahue always used to draw <laughs> TR with a T and an R in the, in the glasses as if readers wouldn't quite get it, you know. <laughs> and when he was really angry with Roosevelt, because um, he was a Democrat, the cartoonist, instead of TR, he would draw two capital letter I's for, you know, his, his ego. This is from a German magazine, Klaterradach, uh, an expatriate American. Johnson drew the cartoon. And uh, very frequently during that campaign, uh, Roosevelt was depicted as a bull moose. Now, the party got that um, nickname because reporters asked him, you know, he was uh, still in his mid-50s, uh, you know, you're strong enough to do this uh, a national campaign again. He said, I'm, I feel as strong as a bull moose. Well, instantly the elephant and the donkey had to move aside a little bit and let a new political icon in. But what is very interesting is that we've had the donkey representing the Democrats since the 1840s and the elephant representing the Republican Party since the uh, 1870s. Thomas Nass drew that. Um, but very, very seldom have cartoonists through the years grafted the face of politicians or the presidents of those parties onto the animals. Even Taft at 350 pounds wasn't pictured as an elephant. They could have done that. Because, you know, you could mail that one in, right? However, Roosevelt was often pictured as the bull moose. It's just, once again, something different about his exceptional personality. Um, now, another time that he, um, I forget what I have next, no. Another time that he referred to the bull moose was when he was shot. Uh, how many know that he was shot while he was campaigning? Yeah, well, not everyone. He was campaigning in Milwaukee when he was running for president in the third party ticket. He had left dinner at the hotel and was getting into a car to go to his speech and a disgruntled bartender from Brooklyn who had been stalking him on the campaign trail who claimed he had a dream that McKinley came to him in a dream and said, avenge my death, you know, go after Roosevelt. Uh, in a point blank range from like five or six feet away, uh, when Roosevelt was standing in the back of the car waving, he shot him in the chest and Roosevelt was knocked, knocked back by the impact. The crowd was ready to tear this guy, John Schrank was his name, apart. And Roosevelt said, no, bring him to me, bring him to me, and he wanted to look at him. He didn't talk to him, he just wanted to see his assailant. He afterwards wrote, by the way, that he, <laughs> he wanted, to, ever the gun enthusiast, um, he wanted to see the gun and he wrote a, fr a friend that it looked like a, uh, a 44 caliber and a 35 frame or something like that. Or something like that. <laughs> presence of mind. Well, presence of mind. He also coughed and there was no blood coming up. And he didn't feel like he was about to die. So he knew the uh, bullet had not entered his lungs. And they wanted to drive him to the hospital, of course. And he said, no, take me to the auditorium. I said, are you crazy, you know? Well, he was crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, I'll deliver the speech or die, it's one thing or the other. Well, he was forceful about it, and they took him to the auditorium. 
and he got on the, uh, got, went up to the podium, and this was so fresh that that news of the shooting had not reached the uh, auditorium. So <laughs> no one knew he had been shot. And he said, I shall ask you to be uh, quieter than usual tonight. You may not realize this, but I have a bullet in my body. <laughs> I have just been shot. And some people thought he was kidding and all of Well, and he opened his coat to take the speech out, and it's the first time he saw it, really, but his shirt was covered in blood. Uh, it entered his right side, and then they said, uh, the witnesses said that he was a little shocked when he opened the speech, and it was a th th speech on thick paper, 50 pages, triple folded, and the bullet had gone through the speech, so that slowed it down a bit. Also nicked a metal s spectacle case that was in his pocket. And he spoke for 90 minutes. <laughs> if I speak for 90 minutes, I deserve to be shot. But I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, who, do, who does that kind of thing? So he finished, and he said, okay, take me to the uh, table. Oh, so anyway, during that speech, you know, uh, there were well-meaning people in the audience who were going crazy, and they said, Colonel, sit down, uh, go to the hospital. And he said, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. You know, so. <laughs> well, there he was. So who acts like that? And I'll tell you, we had the speech and the spectacle case, and okay, the bullet lodged near his, uh, I uh, near a rib. So that slowed it from uh, piercing his lung, and it missed his heart. But the doctor at um, Mercy Hospital in Chicago, after the original um, examination, they took him by train. Now, this may have been the Milwaukee Hospital, but anyway, the doctor said that what he attributed Roosevelt's uh, survival to was his massive chest muscles. He said he's never seen such a physical specimen on his uh, examination table in his life. And that's, um, that's our boy, too. Oh, by the way, it was near the end of the campaign. Wilson and Taft both offered to cease campaigning while Roosevelt was convalescing, and he would not have that. He said, if you could have said anything in good conscience when I was well, you can say the same thing now that I'm convalescing. And in the Roosevelt Dictionary, convalescence meant that two and a half weeks later, he spoke to 12,000 people at Madison Square Garden <laughs> in the days before microphones. So. Uh, this is a cover from Judge during the uh, Spanish-American War, right before the war, after the Maine was, after the Maine exploded. And I'm showing that because there was Judge, there was Puck, there was Life, there were many other magazines. And imagine, you know, now we have Saturday Night Live, okay, and The Daily Show and all like that. But in those days, this is how people got their politics and commentary and satire and gorgeous, gorgeous cartoons uh, like this grace the cover and center spreads and back pages of these magazines. And this is how a lot of the cartoons in the books are, in, in, in Bully, are restored. Some I leave like this and the ragged edges and everything to give readers a sense of the vintage flavor, but some we clean up to look like they did when they were first on the market. Not everyone knows this, but uh, Roosevelt, okay, a sports uh, nut, and he was a boxer uh, until prize fights got too big and crooked and all like that, but he discouraged boxing. But there was a time when football, college football, was almost uh, eliminated because of the injuries and the, the roughness and everything. Roosevelt thought, instead of doing that, just institute some reforms, some other rules and leather helmets and things like that. And he did that. He called college presidents and sports directors together. And for that reason, the NCAA was founded. And the NCAA, even till today, has its annual Roosevelt Award, in which it makes awards to athletes who also do uh, public service. One of the th thousands of things Roosevelt did outside the presidency. By the way, I think 
uh, I don't know if your speaker next month would say this, but I think Roosevelt is the only president we could have when you list all their, all the elements of their biographies about whom you can say that the presidency was just one detail in his life. <laughs> you know, one aspect, he was proud of it, of course, but uh, he did many other things. He said this was his favorite cartoon, uh, and it's a very modest drawing <coughs> of an uh, average farmer after a day's work pulling himself up to the fire and on the wall is a portrait of the president of the U.S. and the fellow is reading the president's message. And Roosevelt uh, requested the original and uh, he said in his autobiography that the type of character that the cartoonist depicted, hard worker, modest, um, <coughs> average, person, we would say today, entrepreneur, middle class, whatever, uh, that was the person he kept in mind his whole presidency, who he wanted to serve and um, keep as, uh, as his hero uh, with his policies. Uh, I, I, I want to write a piece, you know, we're seeing in this campaign that's going on now that uh, everyone on every side always, you must notice this, talking about the middle class all the time, the middle class. Roosevelt would never have done that because his attitude, and I'm not quoting him here, but uh, in corpus, um, he thought a class conscious society was awful. And you know, when he was a cowboy, he was a rancher and he was out with a, uh, a cowboy ranch hand at one time rounding up cattle and the guy brought over a calf with someone else's brand on it but it hadn't taken quite right and the guy said look Mr. Roosevelt we can put your brand right over it and no one would notice it so this could become your calf and Roosevelt fired him on the spot and he said what what for? I'm trying to make you more money. I'm, I'm serving you. And Roosevelt said, any man who will steal for me will steal from me. And I think it's sort of the same thing, I think, as a Roosevelt disciple, that he would have the same distaste for the prattle about the middle class today. Because if you are so focused on the middle class, um, there's an inherent prejudice against the upper class and probably even the lower class. He was president of all the people and he really meant that and he was very sincere about it and this, this figure represented like uh, that ideal and he gave another one of his phrases, a square deal to every American. This is maybe the most famous cartoon of his presidency but a formerly antagonistic cartoonist, Homer Davenport, he switched papers, okay, he was drawing for a Republican paper, but he drew this cartoon, he's good enough for me. And this was re this is reproduced from a postcard, but it was reproduced on posters and pamphlets and you know, all by the millions. And here's a cartoon, or one version of the cartoon by the originator that inspired the teddy bear craze. He was on a, on a hunting trip in Mississippi near the Louisiana border. <laughs> they weren't finding bears. Okay, they found uh, an old sick one uh, from to shoot, and he said, oh, I'm not going to do that. In a bit of a longer story, but the cartoonist having to fill up a um, roundup of the week's events drew this. Drawing the Line in Mississippi was the title of this. He <coughs> turned it into a bear cub, different versions floating around. But there was something about the way he drew that little bear cub that became the cartoonist mascot through the rest of his career. He'd always have that little bear in the corner, uh, Clifford Berryman of the Washington Post and the Washington Star was the cartoonist. But then a toy maker in Brooklyn um, made a stuffed bear and gave it, inspired by this cartoon, the nickname of the teddy bear and uh, there was no looking back after that. Stife in Germany and countless uh, 
manufacturers have made the teddy bear, and it's in our language now, and all our kids' closets. <laughs> this is a drawing, the original of which is in my collection, but uh, so Berriman, uh, you know, started a cottage industry drawing. But he probably, I don't know if he grew to be annoyed, but this was in response to a fan letter, and he just didn't sketch the bear, but um, many versions of it. This is one I have the original of, too, when he appeared, <coughs> appeared in Chicago uh, to fight for the nomination himself, and there never had been a presidential candidate, unless it was a dark horse that was nominated, who actually appeared at the convention and fought for his delegates, and then with the Bull Moose Convention, um, actually appeared and made the acceptance speech right on the stop. But when he arrived in Chicago at the Republican Convention, he went to the Congress Hotel and greeted his supporters from the balcony. And a cartoonist from the New York Sun uh, was there covering that trip and made this lightning sketch at the, uh, on the spot. Oscar Cesar was the uh, cartoonist name. He was the son-in-law of O. Henry. And I wanted to be sure to include this in the presentation tonight because 25 years ago or so, I bought this drawing and um, others by Cesar from that same uh, cycle at Spivey's Bookshop in Westport here in Kansas City which I saw on the internet today thinking I'd visit. Uh, is that a business, huh? Does anyone know, did they move somewhere or? Died. Uh, well, so I'm paying my tribute to Spivey's by showing this off again. Another of the most famous cartoons about Roosevelt <coughs> is when he died. The cartoonist is, you see it in the corner, J.N. Ding. His name was J. Norwood Darling and he drew for the uh, Des Moines Register and Tribune and was a friend of Roosevelt and became active in the conservation movement himself through the years. <coughs> Excuse me, but when he heard the <coughs> news of his idols and his friend's death, he had only a few moments to make the, uh, the uh, morning edition. And he sketched this out, sketchier than most of his cartoons. In fact, he stole the idea from himself two years previous, in 1917, when Buffalo Bill died. He did a similar drawing of a ghostly Buffalo Bill on a horse. It was a little boy and girl waving goodbye to him, but <coughs> that's all Darling could do, and he was going to do a more elaborate one for the next day. But this became an instant success, and he knew not to touch it or try to top it, and this became posters and uh, limited edition, edition etchings. This is one of them, and uh, it captures TR very well. This is the closest I come in the book to a photograph. This is a, a photograph, and it's colored, and the paper ripping and everything is, is the cartoonist's work. But another thing that's remarkable about this guy, um, he reached the nadir of his popularity in 19... 14, 1915, he had, in some people's views, wrecked the Republican Party. Um, he was itching for America to get into World War I, and that was not America's mood at that time. Um, there were people who wanted him to run, run for president again, but he didn't think that was in the cards. <coughs> so, now we fast forward to the election. This appeared two days after the presidential election. He was not the candidate. Charles Evans Hughes was a Republican candidate. Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat candidate. As it turns out, the election was not settled for several days because California's vote was really uh, in the balance, like Ohio's will be, I suppose, in a couple of days, and Florida's, and Wisconsin's and Chad's. <laughs> but what Leslie's, so he wasn't the losing candidate, 
And what Leslie's was doing here, I mean, I think this is fascinating, another thing that cartooning, you know, works on several levels. They were saying with this <coughs> cover, this cartoon montage, is that whoever wins the election, Taft or Hughes, by whatever margin, whatever happens over the next four years, Theodore Roosevelt is still the figure in the American political scene, and they were right. And you could write an editorial or an essay to say that, or you could create a cover like that. And uh, that's brilliant. And that was the case. If he had lived to 1920, by general consensus, he would have been renominated. He was very sick then. He was in a wheelchair. And doctors told him, and Roosevelt said, well, I can be president from a wheelchair, too. And um, a lot of his former opponents, very controversial life. In 1914 or 15, William Barnes, the Republican boss of New York State, sued Roosevelt for libel because Roosevelt called him a crook. <laughs> and, and here's an aspect about Roosevelt. So it was a very public trial and was going back. What Barnes wanted to do was look at Roosevelt's career and prove that he too had made compromises when he didn't have to and he was expedient and he did things the way every politician did it. Well, it turned into a three ring circus when Roosevelt was on the stand because Barnes' side came in with old newspapers and correspondence, piles of papers. Roosevelt <laughs> had nothing, he had his memory. He'd remember verbatim uh, letters he had written, you know, 20 years previous, and he'd go, yeah, he was right, you know, and all this. Um, and also, this is how Roosevelt himself, if he could have been remembered by one word, uh, would have wanted to be remembered, thoroughgoing patriot. And there's the cover of the book. And I'm just going to close with some I'm going to close very quickly on some thoughts about um, 1912 and 2012. Um, I was curator of an exhibition, um, TR in 12. I'm encouraging people to write them in this time around, you know. Um, but the election is not just a coincidence, but it's very instructive right now, especially the fact that progressivism is a term that's being bandied about a lot and everything. And uh, progressivism was not one movement even back then. There's a thought, what has the progressive movement become? Well, it was, there were two strains or more at that time. You know, there was a, a fifth, uh, uh, fourth candidate, we should say, in the 2012 campaign. That was Eugene V. Debs, who was the socialist candidate. And he garnered almost a million votes. It was a high watermark of radicalism and reform in America. <coughs> but Wilson claimed to be a progressive, and so did Roosevelt. Taft even did. And um, they were two different strains of progressivism. And in spite of what Roosevelt did in establishing the regulatory state, and he sure pushed for commissions and, uh, you know, bureaucracy filled with, with boards and regulatory commissions. Um, in spite of that, his goal was always, whatever these reforms were, was to, <coughs> is not isolate, to protect the average man, the small citizen, the entrepreneur. I mean, one thing that motivated him is when he was a rancher, he saw how other ranchers and farmers were being squeezed by the railroads who were colluding and were doing kickbacks and just all that kind of stuff. And there, was, there was no recourse. So there were many elements in his experience that brought him to the point of thinking that the only way, especially as interstate commerce was growing, to answer this challenge was through regulation. But he was never a statist, he was never a paternalist. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's not. Wilson, on the other hand, uh, ran as a Jeffersonian, a small government candidate, uh, and 
talked that way, he campaigned that way, but by 1914, his brand of progressivism was very statist. You know, he brought in, under him, the Federal Reserve System and the uh, Federal Trade Commission, and a lot of these um, um, parts of big, big government that sort of cemented relations with big business, and he and uh, Louis Brandeis and uh, Colonel House and others uh, changed progressivism that way. So it's my view that um, there's a direct line from Wilson to FDR, Roosevelt's cousin, uh, to Truman and, uh, you know, Kennedy, Johnson, and, and so forth, and that the tradition of Theodore Roosevelt's progressivism um, was of a different sort. It was more nationalism than it was paternalism and once again holding up an image not of the collective society but a group of, a nation of individuals. He didn't invent the term rugged individualism, that was Hoover, but uh, that was Roosevelt's ideal. Now we can only guess, and it's either funny or annoying depending on your mood, depending on your point of view I suppose, but most of Roosevelt's disciples and followers, the main figures, and all of his family members uh, were fierce opponents of his seventh cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, hated the New Deal. Most of them were American firsters, were um, isolationists. So we can only guess, but um, it's interesting to speculate where Roosevelt would have been if he had uh, lived longer. Um, and one thing I, I will close with is that to illustrate my point, Roosevelt's name has been invoked in the last couple of years. Uh, during the healthcare debate, uh, President Obama himself used to, um, I suppose still does, uh, tweak the, the uh, Republicans and conservatives by saying even Teddy Roosevelt wanted national health insurance. Well, three strikes here out. Roosevelt hated to be called Teddy. If you notice, I haven't called him Teddy. And Ted heads like me are very respectful of that. It's Theodore Roosevelt, and it's Roosevelt, not Roosevelt. Um, but anyway, he was not for national health insurance. And if I were gra granted an extra month to talk, I have his, uh, his famous, his five fav famous speeches during the Progressive Era, the Osawatomie, Kansas speech, or Osawatomie, excuse me, um, the right of the people to rule, his confession of faith, the Progressive Party platform, et cetera, et cetera. He never called for national health insurance. Progressive Party never did. He wanted a Department of Health and Rural Life. He wanted uh, workman's compensation. He wanted the government to enforce, um, you know, the six-day work week, uh, the eight-hour day, uh, et cetera, anti-child labor, all that kind of stuff. But he was never in favor, and government regulation of uh, to require employees when there were workplace injuries, but he never uh, advocated socialized medicine or national health insurance, and uh, we don't have to go through old speeches to see that. He had other parts of his platform that were less radical than that would have been that still incited firestorms of controversy if he had been for, in 1910 to 1912, socialized medicine uh, the nation would have gone crazier than it did. Um, but, uh, so I like to make that point and encourage anyone who was interested in history just to dig, dig, dig. I mean, no one contradicted Obama and the Democrats during that debate. It was just assumed, oh yeah, Roosevelt, progressive, oh yeah, I get it, he did. Well, he didn't stand for those things. But uh, in closing, I'll say that the, um, it's another example of how forceful this man was on the American scene that a hundred years later, people were still invoking his memory and his stands, even if picking his pocket, just to, um, to get approval for what they, um, what they were advancing themselves. Now actually this is the final thing. I'll say this, when he was shot, Excuse me, I mean, okay, get the hook, please. But, 
Uh, this is how I intended to, uh, to, to, to close. And I was privileged before to uh, speak to uh, Mayor Barnes' uh, class on, on leadership. Leadership, he was a leader, inspired people. That's what leaders do. He gave a speech in 1912 at Carnegie Hall called The Right of the People to Rule. And it was almost prophetic. It was almost like Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in which, and I'll, I'll quote this for you here, uh, he almost predicted um, what he uh, came to when he was shot. And it was widely quoted when he was shot in October of 1912. But in that speech, he said, the leader for the time being, whoever he may be, is but an instrument to be used until broken and then to be cast aside. And when he is cast aside, you know, when he is broken, he will care no more than a soldier cares when he is sent where his life is forfeit in order that the victory may be won. He said, in the long fight for righteousness, the watchword is spend and be spent. It matters little whether any one man fails or succeeds, but the cause shall not fail, for it is the cause of mankind. And he said, we here in America hold in our hands the hope of the world, the fate of the coming years. Shame and disgrace will be ours if we drag in the dust the golden hopes of men, if in our eyes the light of high resolve is dimmed. Unquote Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you.